Good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. Uh, let's see. Do we have audio? Yes. Hello, testing. Am I being heard? Yes. Okay. We were talking Thursday. Friday was a rerun, obviously, for those regular listeners, and I apologize for my absence, but it was necessary. Last time, th Thursday, we were talking about indulgences, the selling of grace for money, the buying of men's souls from purgatory, this imagined place of suffering that the Roman Catholic Church teaches is where souls go to be purified, as if Christ's salvation was ineffectual, which is the entire purpose of the Roman Catholic Church, to render Christ useless and to, to put man's desires and heart uh, toward the papacy, who has the keys to salvation. The great imposture of indulgences is born out of the error that is taught in the churches, almost universally in the world. The Christian world is taught the immortality of the soul, that when one dies, one either goes directly to heaven, directly to hell, or in the case of Catholics, to purgatory, to be purged of their sins. And because of this erroneous doctrine called the immortality of the soul, arose this fictitious place called purgatory, and out of that arose indulgences, whereby the priests of Rome can sell your ticket out of, of uh, purgatory. Have literally reduced mankind to merchandise, to profit from. And this is this therein lies the root of the in, incalculable wealth of the Roman Catholic Church. No wonder that in ages past the Roman Catholic Church owned one third of the land of Europe. All of Europe fell for this imposture called the immortality of the soul and purgatory and indulgences and the Roman Catholic Church raked in the gold raked in the land raked in the property until she owned a third of Europe now where God's people taught the truth that when you die you die and if you die in the Lord you are safe for all eternity. And though you lie in your grave a thousand years, when the resurrection takes place, you will live again in peace and harmony with God. But until then, you lie peacefully in your grave, not aware of your good deeds, not aware of your bad deeds, not aware of God, not aware of Satan, not aware of the passage of time. Just like a seed, when it is planted in the ground, it must first die before it can spring back to life. The Scripture confirms there is no immortality of the soul. For it says, for this mortal must take on immortality. Now, when does the mortal take on immortality? At the resurrection. That's what the Bible teaches. And I offered my listeners at the end of the broadcast, if you can find one, le one legitimate testimony in the Scripture for the immortality of the soul, please send it to me. And I didn't receive any offers. The Bible does not teach the immortality of the soul. The churches do. Even the Protestant churches do. The evangelical churches do because they simply parrot the words of the Roman Catholic Church. Now, continue with our discussion about indulgences, backing up one paragraph for continuity. It says, The monk John Tetzel, a Dominican, whom the Pope, that is, Pope Leo X, placed in charge of the gates of purgatory and the selling of indulgences, had a little saying. It went something like this. 
the very moment that the money clinks against the bottom of the chest, the soul escapes from purgatory and flies free to heaven. Oh, senseless people, said Tetzel, this day heaven is on all sides open, with, and with ten groschen you can deliver your father from purgatory, and you, and you so ungratefully will not rescue him. All right, first the lie that there is a purgatory and that your father is in it burning, as it were, in hell, and that you may rescue him with money. And then the guilt trip, but you will not. And so the gold just rained from the skies for the Pope. All of Europe fell for this diabolical bargain that you could buy your friends and your relatives out of this imagined place called purgatory because you first believed in the immortality of the soul, not realizing that your dead friends and relatives are safe and secure in the grave awaiting the resurrection. They cannot be molested by, by Satan or his pope or his priests. Now, why is it? Why is it that God's people will not come to the knowledge of the truth? As I said before, some of the most some of the most moving gratitude that I ever hear from my listeners, either on Inquisition Update or on amateur radio, is when this reality finally sinks in that there is no life in the grave. That when, the, when your breath leaves your nostrils, you cease to be a living soul. Your mortal becomes dead. And it isn't awakened until the resurrection. You are safe. Blessed is he that dieth in the Lord from henceforth. If you understand all this, the grievous error in the teaching of the immortality of the soul then you'll understand why Satan so contended for the body of Moses when he died and why God buried him in secret. If you have ever asked yourself, what in the world would, was Satan planning to do with the bones of Moses? Since he so vigorously contended for the bones of Moses when he died. All you have to do is look at the Roman Catholic Church and see what they've done with the bones of the saints. They would have put them all together, as they say they did with the bones of St. Peter in St. Peter's Basilica, and put them up for sale to offer you forgiveness of, of sins and eternal life if you will come to Rome on a pilgrimage, a pilgrimage and place your money in the bottom of the chest. Pay Rome money to see and touch Peter's bones. What do you think Satan would have done with the bones of Moses? All you have to do is look at the Roman Catholic Church and what they've done with the bones of the so-called saints. Now you know why Satan so heavily contended for the bones of Moses. And we can see it even today in the Roman Catholic Church, exactly what Satan would do with the bones of Moses. No one need to ask anymore what Satan would have done with the bones of Moses were God to hand them over. But Moses lies peacefully in his grave, dead to the world, not aware of his good deeds, not aware of his bad deeds, not aware of his God, not aware of Satan. He's protected in the bosom of Abraham, the grave, and he will rise with the saints, and he will see his God. He lies in the same peace that Job lies in. There is no immortality of the soul. 
Look at the world of iniquity, the world of false doctrine, the world of the teaching of men that have erected from the, the selling of this idea of the immortality of the soul. A world of iniquity. And the whole world seems beholden to the doctrine that has been contaminated all of Christianity. The immortality of the soul. What gratitude. The only really heartfelt gratitude. Gratitude that I receive from my listeners that seeps right down to the very marrow of my bones when they finally realize the truth. What a blessing. What a blessing. I can't... There are no words to describe the overwhelming sense of gratitude that I get from people who finally comprehend the false doctrine of the immortality of the soul. What peace comes over them. And I feel it too. And all of a sudden, when this, the truth comes out about the immortality of the soul, you, all, of the, all of the lies of the Roman Catholic Church lie bare. Exposing the truth. That's what Inquisition Update is all about. But Tetzel was the marketer of, the, of, of purgatory. He was the marketer. He, he pretended that his pope held the keys to this so-called imagined purgatory and that he could open purgatory and release souls if, he gave, if, he, if you gave enough money. Returning to the book where we left off Friday it says, or Thursday, it says, Tetzel famously said concerning indulgences, listen to this. Our Lord God no longer deals with us as God. He has given all power to the Pope. That's the Roman Catholic Church. It's Antichrist. It's a lie. Doctrines of demons... Setting aside the law of God by teaching the doctrines of men. He continues, he says, We're told that in order to better regulate this traffic, this commerce, the selling of indulgences, was invented probably by Pope John the Twenty Second, the the famous and scandalous tariff of indulgences. Here this author, or rather this this uh, seller of indulgences was called called his indulgences a tariff or a tax of indulgences. This is where we get the sin tax today. You doing something in violation of God's law, the Pope just slaps a sin tax on it, makes it legal for money. This is Antichrist. It says a truly diabolical mischief, for it creates a false conscience in the penitent believer. A false conscience is created when we are erroneously taught that forgiveness can be bought with money. It says, nay, more, the Romish heresy of indulgences is a cancer that eats away at both faith and morals. As one Roman ambassador said of purgatory, quote, Our divines obstinately defend it, for upon that doctrine, the doctrine of purgatory and indulgences, depends the payment of masses, indulgences, and pious gifts. Put down purgatory, and you take away from them all opportunity of acquiring wealth and honor. Let me read that again. The last portion of his quote says, you put down purgatory and you strip from the priests of Rome all opportunity of acquiring wealth and honor. And that's where their power lies, in their wealth and in the honor that men pay to them. Because they claim to be the representatives of God on earth. You strip away from them indulgences. The ability to sell indulgences, there goes their money, and there goes their honor. There goes the Roman Catholic Church, right in the pit where it belongs. 
The author continues, he says, the horrible excesses of this practice of indulgences are given by the historian Grattan Guinness, the Protestant historian Grattan Guinness, in his work entitled The Approaching End of the Age. He said this, listen, there was a published scale of the prices for which different sins could be pardoned, and that the gain of money was the only object was clear from the enormous price charged for indulgences for certain crimes likely to be committed by the rich, crimes only by the laws of the church, not by the laws of God, while the grossest violations of the law of God were excused for a trifle, in other words, a small payment, the merely conventional crime of marriage of a first, with a first cousin cost a thousand dollars, while the terrible sins of wife murder or parricide cost only four dollars. They turned the law of God on its head. That's what the Roman Catholic Church is all about, to turn the kingdom of heaven on its head. He said the famous author of the history of Romanism, John Dowling, tells of a comical incident in the life of this notorious snake oil, snake oil salesman, John Tetzel, whose imposture was the main motivation for Luther's challenge, Martin Luther's challenge to the teachings of Rome. Listen to what John Dowling says. Quote, A gentleman of Saxony had heard Tetzel at Leipzig, and was much shocked by his impostures. He went to the monk and acquired if he was authorized to pardon sins of intention, or such as the applicant intended to commit. Assuredly, answered Tetzel, I have full power from the Pope to do so. Well, returned the gentleman, I want to take some slight revenge on one of my enemies, without attempting his life, of course. I will pay you ten crowns if you will give me a letter of indulgence that shall bear me harmless. Tetzel made some scruples, got out his little calculator, and decided that they would strike a deal for thirty crowns. Shortly thereafter, the monk set out for Leipzig. In other words, Tetzel had uh, drained that particular location of all of its gold and wealth and land and all the other indulgence money that he could gather. So he was heading on to another city. And it says this gentleman who purchased this indulgence from Tetzel, attended by his servants, laid wait for Tetzel in a wood between Jutterbach and Treblin. And they fell upon him and gave him a good beating and then carried off his chest of money. Tetzel clamored against this act of violence and brought an action in the courts before the judges. But the gentleman showed the letter signed by Tetzel himself, which exempted him beforehand for all responsibility. Duke George, who had at first been irritated by this action, upon seeing this writing, ordered that the accused should be acquitted. Quite humorous, isn't it? The man, seeing through this imposture called indulgences, simply asked Tetzel, Will you sell me an indulgence for a crime that I'm planning to commit and hold me blameless in any court of law in this land? Why, sure, Tetzel says. It'll be so, so much money. So he writes him an indulgence for this revenge that he's going to take out on his uh, so-called friend, and they wait for him when he, when he comes down the road. And they land on him, take all his money, steal all the money that he stole from God's people. And you must know that he was stricken by the Spirit of God and wanted to return all that money to all the people that Tetzel had built. So Tetzel files a, a lawsuit against him, hauls him into court, and accuses him of stealing his money and beating him half to death. And the judge, who was initially very upset by this, once presented by this imposture called indulgence that Tetzel signed with his own hand, the judge let the man go. Righteousness prevailed. This is the righteousness that should prevail in God's house today. We send the indulgence taker 
right back to Rome where he belongs. No more sin taxes. Don't pay them. Just simply obey God's law. That's our duty as Christians. That's what we ought to be about. It says, on the same page, John Dowling relates another less humorous account concerning the sale of indulgences. He says, a miner from Schneeberg meeting a seller of indulgences inquired of him, saying, must we then believe what you have often said of the power of indulgences and the authority of the Pope, that we can redeem a soul from purgatory by casting a penny into the chest? The dealer in indulgences affirmed that it was so. Ah, replied the miner, what a cruel man the Pope must be, thus leaving a poor soul to suffer so long in this imagined place called purgatory for a wretched penny. That's the truth. If God's people would just wake up to the truth. What a wicked, wicked son of hell, son of perdition the papacy is. With all the gold and wealth of the Roman Catholic Church, if, if all it took was money to deliver someone from this imagined place called purgatory, then he could release everybody, and everybody would get a free pass to heaven. But the Pope won't do it. That ought to wake up the dead. That ought to wake up the spiritually dead who go to a Roman Catholic Church every Sunday and think they're worshiping God. In 2006, get a load of this. You think Rome has changed? In 2006, the present Pope, Benedict XVI, gave the largest indulgence in history. In so doing, he said, bring money, bring money. And millions in this age of enlightenment still pay for these lying indulgences. And now you know why the Roman Catholic Church is so rich. And now you know why the Roman Catholic Church owns so much of this country we call America. Now you know why the Roman Catholic Church controls our government and our banking and every other thing, including our courts. The author says, gentle reader, there are more than 40 editions of these indulgences. The least delicate ears would be shocked were one to repeat all the abominations to be found in it. Incest shall cost, if not known, five gross. If known, six gross. The charge is so much for murder, so much for infanticide, so much for indulgence, uh, adultery, so much for purgatory, for perjury, for robbery, for violence. They sell sin. And don't you know they market in sin, too? That's why the Pope's Mafia markets sin so that men and women and children will commit sin so that they'll feel an obligation to pay for their sins see what a racket this is now you remember Romans or Revelation chapter 18 where it says he markets in the souls of men this can apply to none other than the Pope of Rome our Bible told us the truth from the very beginning, and history confirms it. The author continues, Oh, shame on Rome, explained Claudius Despers, a Catholic theologian. But Rome knows no shame in the same way a prostitute has no shame. And that's why John the Revelator described the Roman Catholic Church as a whore. We can believe the Bible. The author continues, he says, Only say they, let a man purchase letters of indulgence, and the salvation of his soul is secured. Only let him obtain them for others in purgatory, and as soon as the money tinkles in the chest, their spirits escape from the place of torment and ascend into heaven. It was affirmed that the most heinous crimes might be remitted, unquote, with the purchase of money. Filthy lucre. That's what the Roman Catholic Church is all about. Filthy lucre. 
It says, the priest claimed to grant absolution from a, for a sin which a man shall intend to commit in the future. Boy, how handy that would come in in Washington, D.C., wouldn't it? And so almost all of Europe sought after the Pope's indulgences. The sale of wickedness. And to make sure that there's plenty of sins for which to atone oneself with money, the papacy in secret supports his mafia that markets the vice throughout all the world. Drugs, prostitution, sex rings, every vice known to man, pornography, gun running, murder, Murder Incorporated. That's what the Roman Catholic Church is. And while the Roman Catholic Church stands publicly condemning the Mafia in secret, they are the marketers of the Pope's vices, sins. And it keeps this traffic, this commerce called indulgences alive. And Roman Catholics and Christians from all over the world go to these priests seeking absolution for their sins that the Roman Catholic Church markets through their mafia and the priest says I'll forgive your sins for so much money or so much land and now we're slaves to the papacy no wonder Martin Luther full of the spirit of God and the knowledge of his word condemned this imposture and it would be completely eradicated from the world if we would just admit the truth, the scriptural truth, that there's no life in the grave. There's no immortality of the soul. Doctrines of men, they set aside the law of God, deceive all the people by lies that can be, under, that can be uncovered simply by reading the scriptures. It says, in the year A.D. 1300, wrote French historian Merle de Bigny, quote, in one month they counted in Rome as many as 100,000 pilgrims. All these strangers brought rich offerings. The Pope and the Romans, that is, those who live in Rome, saw their coffers fill rapidly with the payment for indulgences. De Bigny adds, quote, to cause men to purchase for a price in money the salvation which God freely bestows, such is popery, unquote. Such is Antichrist. Says another author, quote, full remission of sins, past, present, and future, and release from all the pains and penalties incurred were promised to all. The people were taught that by the payment of money to the church, the Roman Catholic Church, they might free themselves from sin, as well as release the souls of their deceased friends and family who were confined in the tormenting flames of this imagined place called purgatory. By such means did Rome fill her coffers and sustain the magnificence, the luxury, and the vice of the pretended representatives of him, capital H, who had not where to lay his head. What a contrast we see from Christ and Antichrist. Christ had no place to where, where to lay his head, but the Pope lives in incalculable luxury and wealth and power and influence. And below, we see two woodcut carvings juxtaposing Christ and Antichrist. Here is Christ with a whip in his hand, a hand-fashioned whip, chasing the money, the, 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 uh, the money changers out of the temple. And juxtaposed with that is another woodcut of the Pope, the antithesis of Christ, inviting the money changers right in in the church. The note, the caption underneath these woodcuts says, 
Note the many contrasts between Christ and his pretended vicar. The one drives the money changers out of the temple, and the other invites them in. Notice, too, the dogs within the Pope's temple. And then he quotes a passage from Scripture. Outside are dogs, says the book of Revelation, chapter 22, 15. The man who carved these woodcuts knew his Bible, and he knew the truth. The author continues, he said, And nothing has changed much to this day. As Bernard Wall wrote in 1957 in his book, The Vatican Story, quote, The picture of an old pope counting his golden ingots in solitude still springs to minds when we still springs to my, our minds when we see the bullion coffers preserved in the Vatican. Unquote. That's right. They still champion the days of the money grubbing, the gold and land grubbing papacy, and these bullion coffers in the Vatican. That's the source of her power and wealth and influence. It comes from Satan himself. And it began with, with, with Satan's contention for the bones of Moses. This is exactly what is manifest today in the Roman Catholic Church. The sale of salvation for money. The free gift that God gave in his only begotten son that we might be freely redeemed of our sins if we will just accept the payment that he offered for us. The shedding of his own blood. For without the, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Christ knew the cost of redeeming us from our sin, and he gladly paid it so that we might possess it for free. Just simply by accepting it. We have no friend in this world but Christ. But the Pope says, you can have your salvation, but you've got to pay me to get it. And the evangelical bellies want to unite with that system? They want to give up the free gift of salvation in Christ's blood and accept the Antichrist Pope and his indulgences? What fool, what fool would exchange the free gift of salvation in Christ for the church of Antichrist? To return from the freedom of our deliverer, Christ, who delivered us from Egypt, they want to go back to Egypt. Well, let them go. I'm not going with them. Isaac Lansden wrote in his seminarical, wrote about the seminarical practice of indulgences. He says, quote, the leading ecclesiastics. Now, we're talking about the Roman Catholic Church now. The leading ecclesiastic of Germany, Albert, the, Albish, the Archbishop of Mainz, afterward who became a cardinal, having boldly purchased his office at a great price, reimbursed himself and poured money into the papal treasury, by securing the monopoly of the sale of indulgences, of which Tetzel was the agent and auctioneer. The priests, largely corrupted in morals and, care and careless of the welfare of the people, were willing that the flock should be plundered, provided the spoil went to the treasury of the Roman Catholic Church. Even the Jesuit fave at the Diet of Worms testified that the priests were guilty of grievous crimes. The people shrouded in dark superstition, a superstition that they got from the Roman Catholic Church in the belief of the immortality of the soul, the transmigration of the soul, the, the, the imposture called in uh, a purgatory, who, these people who were ignorant of the Holy Scriptures were enslaved by their ecclesiastical masters, were still redeemed, or excuse me, were still deemed by the church worthy of plundering, and were yielding up their wealth to enrich the papal court, that is, the Vatican, south of the Alps. Unquote. Reader, what an enormous swindle. If the Roman Catholic Church and the Roman Catholic people would see into what projects their swindled mass money goes, let him visit the cathedral in Mexico City, the largest church in the American continent. 
This edifice was begun in 1573 and completed in 1667. Nearly a hundred years to build this church at a cost of what then was two million dollars. Imagine what it would cost today. It said the cathedral occupies the site of the great Aztec temple of Montezuma. The cathedral itself is 500 feet long and 420 feet wide. Quote, the first object that presents itself to one entering it is the altar. Erected on a platform in the center of the building, it is made of highly wrought and highly polished silver and covered with a profusion of crosses and ornaments of pure gold. It is surmounted by a small temple in which rests the figure of the Virgin of Comedios, who enjoys the exclusive right of three petticoats, one embroidered in pearls, another in emeralds, and the third in diamonds the value of which is credibly stated at not less than three million dollars. On each side of this altar runs a balustrade. The balusters are about four feet high and four inches thick in the largest part. And all of these, the balustrade, the handrail, and the images are made of a compound of gold, silver, and copper more valuable than silver. It is said that an offer was once refused to take this balustrade and replace it with another of exactly the same size and workmanship of pure silver, and to give half a million dollars besides. As as you walk through the building, on either side there are different apartments filled from floor to ceiling with paintings, statues, vases, huge candlesticks, waiters, and a thousand other articles of gold and silver such as only the everyday display of articles of least value, the more costly are stored away in chests and closets, said the abbot. Look at the wealth. Just follow the money, and you'll follow the corruption right to Rome. Altars made with hands. What was the, the law of God when the, the Jews were, were going to build an altar? God said, if you lay a tool on the stones, you've polluted it. What do you see in the Roman Catholic Church? Hewn stone, don't you? We have example after example after example in the Scriptures of how to positively identify the Roman Catholic Church as being what it is. Won't we just accept it? It says the jeweled vestments of the Virgin enshrined in this magnificent building are said to have cost three million dollars, while the garments of the priests who minister to her on state occasions are proportionate in value, and they are so heavy that the wearers can scarcely stand under their weight when pronouncing the benediction. Unquote. Another quote says, the, uh, the, the cathedral, says Abbott, was but one of 70 or 80 churches in the city of Mexico City whose wealth and splendor made them remarkable in an age when the church claimed a monopoly of the treasures of the world. Said Samuel Gregory, quote, This is only one of the churches of the city of Mexico, where there are between 60 and 80 others, and some of them possessing little less wealth than the cathedral. All the other large cities, such as Puebla, Guadalajara, Guanajuato, uh, Valladolid, uh, Zacatecas, uh, uh, Durango, St. Louis, Potosi, have each a proportionate number of equally gorgeous establishments. So, Roman Catholic cathedrals all over Mexico City. The wealth of Mexico is invested in these Roman Catholic cathedrals. No wonder the people are starving to death. No wonder the people have no money. They live in squalor. They live in need of the basic necessities of life. And they simply come flooding into this country to find something to eat. The Roman Catholic Church has forever starved the Mexican people. This is the example set in all Roman Catholic countries. 
debt and servitude, sin from wall to wall. And they pay indulgences to the church to buy their souls from purgatory. There's no greater racket anywhere in the world than the Roman Catholic Church. And she displays her wealth for all the world to see. No shame. Just as a harlot displays her wealth in the jewelry that she wears, the Roman Catholic Church displays her wealth in her cathedrals. The analogy of describing the Roman Catholic Church as a whore in the, in the Bible is a perfect example. This is exactly what God was trying to convey to us. Abbott rejoins, quote, It would be the wildest, most random conjecture to attempt to estimate the amount of the, of the precious metals thus withdrawn from the useful purposes of the currency of the world and wasted in these barbaric ornaments as incompatible with good taste as they are with humility, which was one of the most striking, uh, which was the most striking feature in the character of the founder, capital F, of our religion, Jesus Christ, unquote. In 1958, John F. Coulthart wrote the following, book, uh, the following in his book, What I Saw in Rome, quote, walked across to the church of St. Pietro in Vincoli, it's called the it's called Saint Peter's in Saint Peter in Chains. You will see the famous Moses, Michelangelo's masterpiece in sculpture. Truly, this is an amazing piece of work. Originally, it was meant to be one of the group of 42 statues in Saint Peter's Cathedral to decorate the tomb of the Pope, who laid the foundation stone of the great basilica. The Vatican contains one. 1,100 rooms heaped with rare treasures and artworks. They really constitute a great museum. The Hall of Maps shows many of the early impressions of what the world looked like. These are arranged one after another along a great corridor. The Egyptian section would rival even the British Museum's collection from Egypt. The Vatican Library is too wonderful for words and simply brings tears to the eyes. Every inch of the walls and ceilings and pillars of this 1,250-foot-long room is covered with beautiful frescoes. There are so many priceless treasures in the Vatican that the mind boggles. That's from page 13 of his work. <clears throat> and anybody today who has seen the Vatican will describe it in terms similar to these indescribable wealth. In fact, says Coulthart, inside St. Peter's Basilica in the Vatican Treasury, there's more wealth than one will ever see in a lifetime. There are great thrones made of gold and a profusion of crosses crusted with gems of all kinds. There's so much gold heaped up that the eyes grow tired of it. Although the although the pearls and the jewels, by reason of their diversity of beauty, still attract my gaze. I saw one of the Pope's tiaras, its three tiers, showing that he is king of heaven, king of the earth, and king of the lower regions, hell, purgatory. On a side note, while I dispute the Pope's claims to the first two regions... I'm satisfied to allow the lower regions if he chooses to claim that way. And that is his true domain, the pit. Thus saith God. Revelation chapter 14, verse 15. Read it for yourself. My Catholic friends, on a more serious note, the patent for the franchise of indulgences was not granted either by Christ or his apostles, but by the enemy of souls, the fallen archangel, Satan himself. How precisely does Revelation chapter 18 verse 13 speak of Antichrist when it predicted that she would trade in the, quote, souls of men, unquote, Reader, Rome alone traffics in that article. The souls of men. She's the only church that demands a man to make payment for saying masses 
for the saving of his soul. Indeed, to further augment this human trafficking, the Roman Catholic Church doctrines encourage vice and sin in its members, the more to ensure that they will have no certain confidence in being saved except by praying and paying out of purgatory. There's not a more successful commercial enterprise than the Roman Catholic Church. The Papal Church purports to give its penitents liberty to sin in this world and permits them to buy their way out of purgatory and thereby escape punishment uh, for having sinned. This, as I said in Book 1, says the author, is a delusive, dastardly deception, a vain attempt to cheat the devil of the souls of those willing and impenitent sinners who are rightfully his. What a lucrative and nefarious enterprise these twin flagrant and impious conceits called indulgences and purgatory, and I will shamelessly add the doctrine of the immortality of the soul, because from that false doctrine springs all of these other crimes. Who else but that wicked system of Antichrist could conceive so vain a scheme and then demand that poor deluded souls pay for the privilege by regularly in, by regular installments, financial installments at the Mass? But the Roman Catholic Church shamelessly insists that she can prove purgatory to really and truly exist by no less than the testimony of a certain Saint Adelio, who it is said, quote, heard the devil and his demons complain that they had great reason, surely, uh, for, for complaining that the souls of dead men were daily snatched out of their hands by the alms and prayers of the living, unquote. That's a quote from the Dissuasion from Popery, Part 1, Chapter 1, Book 4. But we think that there's an even better and earlier authority than that, for we have it on certain authority that it was either Virgil or Cicero in his dream of Scipio, or Plato in his uh, Georgius, or his Phaedo, or his Sado on the Treatise of the Soul, who are indeed the surest authors to prove purgatory, for these all agree in affirming the rewards and punishments of another life. Why, who needs the proof of Scripture or the words of the apostles when we can find such eminent authorities as these, Plato and Scipio? Teaching the commandments of men. That's what the Roman Catholic Church does. They set aside the law and the teachings of God for the teachings and the laws of men. We have Christ on the one side and Antichrist on the other. And it just seems that all of Christendom is having trouble distinguishing between the two when the difference is so obvious. He says, I wish to digress a little and say a few words about this Saint Adelio and his legacy that may be of general interest to my reader. In the Catholic calendar on the day of All Saints Day, uh, uh, the day after All Saints Day is All Souls Day, the 2nd of November, a day for the faithful to pray for the suffering souls in purgatory. This holiday, or Holy Day as they call it, or should be called the Wiccan Holiday, was started in 988 by St. Adelio and is said after he heard the devil say that the souls of the dead were daily snatched out of his hands by the alms and prayers of the living. And I will just add the words in the Roman Catholic Church. And this is where we got Halloween. 